Hi friends, welcome to Cookout. I'm Chef Maria Hines, and today we're doing a one-pot seafood risotto. You'll hear me talk about local a lot and, and eating local as a chef. The reason why I highly value it is because it tastes so good. You can really taste the difference. Like the shorter amount of time your food takes to travel to get to your plate, the better it's gonna taste. And when you have access to incredible ingredients, you don't really need to do that much to them. You do whatever you can to let it speak for itself. It's inspiring to me to cook this dish because we're using all this beautiful local seafood, all this local shellfish, and it's something that's really engaging. A lot of people can participate. So if you got a few people at camp, everyone can kind of take turns having their hands in the dish and helping prepare the meal that y'all get to share in the end. We're ready to cook. We have all of our mise en place laid out here. Mise en place basically means everything in its place in French. We have our clams and our mussels right here. And I wanna get in close here because I wanna talk about this. I know, this was a, this was a little bit, a little trickier today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, I gotta clear the boom. Just, okay. just like, <laughs> like ninja that I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Something that you wanna do is you wanna make sure that you clean off the little beards. You can just kinda whoop, take it off like that so it's nice and cleaned up. Another thing you wanna do, you wanna make sure that they're all closed up. If they're closed up, then it means it's live. These are just like so healthy and beautiful. I don't think I will have the opportunity to show you. If your shell is opened up just a little bit, just a little bit, what you can do is you take it, and you tap it, and when you tap it like that, it'll slowly close up if it's live. If it's dead, when you tap it, it will not slowly close, and then just discard it because it could like kind of spoil your whole, your whole dish. Another thing with your shellfish is you want to purge them, and you want to purge them because they're little filter feeders, and so they get like little bits of sand and little bits of grit inside of them. Get some cold water just running over it, and you can let it sit in cold water for a couple of hours and then to store them in your cooler or to store them in your refrigerator. If they're in a plastic wrap bag or anything wrapped, they can suffocate and then all open up. So you wanna just um, keep them really cold. I put just a wet paper towel over the top and then I just put the ice on top. So it keeps it nice and nice and cold. Shellfish, it likes to be cold. It likes to have moisture. That way you'll have a, a really beautiful product. Okay, here we go. We have our Parmesan, our peas, lemon, baby spinach, olive oil, butter. We have some chicken stock. We have canned tomatoes. It's a little bit easier at camp. And then we have some beautiful shrimp here. And then we have these beautiful spring beauties that come up in the meadow area. As soon as the snow melts, this is one of the first flowers that we see. I love eating live foraged food. It's such a pleasure and it's such a gift. And so let's talk a little bit about our rice. There's two different kinds that is traditionally used in this Italian dish that we're gonna create together. One is aborio rice and the other one is carnarole rice. So this right here is the grain that you're looking for. You see this right here? You can see a little bit of starch right there. That's good. That's what this rice is all about. That's what's gonna give it that nice creamy texture that we're looking for. You know, when you have like the perfect risotto, that's what it's all about. That's all of the ingredients that we have that we're gonna put in one pot today. Most of the work is gonna be done over the fire. So you're only busting your knife out for these two things right here. You always wanna make sure your knives are sharp. They'll perform better sharp. Bad habit, cooking for 30 years. Someone taught me how to do it towards me. It's not the way to do it. It's the way I do it because it's a bad habit. Away from you. Couple little tips. It's always nice to cut off the ends first. Keep your fingers tucked back. You go from the tip, you kind of go down, you drive it down, and you push away. We're gonna look for the core, but you see that? That's where the core is. Leave the core and you wanna start on this end because the core is what's gonna keep the whole onion together. We're gonna take our knife, we're gonna make it nice and flat. So first we went this way. Now we're gonna go this way. You wanna use your hand to keep it all grouped together. And then you just, remember you start from the tip, you push forward. So now we have all the onion. Now we have our garlic here. I'm gonna gather all this stuff up. Let's go over to the fire and make some risotto together. 
In the wine world, there's a French term, terroir, and terroir is basically within the fruit itself. You, you're actually tasting the soil makeup. You're tasting the sun if you're near the ocean. It's the same thing with shellfish and a lot of other items, like you taste the terroir in food. You're going to experience that flavor, that whole interconnectedness, this whole holistic vibration that you get when you're eating food that comes from a place and you have an awareness of it. The reason why I moved up here to cook was because of the bounty to come up here and to be able to cook with ingredients that are literally all around you and it's all local. To me, that's the best way to cook. That's the most inspiring way to cook and it's the most honest way to cook. You're letting all of the food express itself. I brought this solo stove in so we could cook today. These things are great because they're, you know, transportable. You can, you can take them anywhere. So that's what we're gonna be working with for our live fire cooking today. The first thing I'm going to do is add a little bit of olive oil to it. And just so you know, this is gonna go pretty quickly. Like this is a situation you're cooking with live fire. It's not a gas burner where you can, you know, lower the temperature or bring the temperature up. So if it gets too ripping hot, I'm gonna pull it off if I feel like it's getting too hot and I'm losing control over the, the pot. And what I mean by losing control is like shit starts burning. You can see how the oil is over here on this side. So, you know, every once in a while, just do this, yeah? Okay, so that way everything's nice and even. So things are gonna move quickly. You can hear how quickly they're moving. I wanna sweat the onion, I wanna soften it. So right now you can see it's a white onion. When we get done with it, it should be kind of a translucent color. Then that means that it's all the flavor has come out. So we're looking to bring all the flavor out of the onion. We wanna bring the sweetness out of the onion. If it is getting too hot too quickly, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna deglaze my pan with the wine that we're gonna drink. Deglazing basically means getting it to unstick from the pan, reducing the liquid down. By saying we're gonna reduce the white wine out of it, that means we want the pan to go dry, okay? Anything that reduces it intensifies, right? And so as it's reducing, it intensifies. What is it intensifying? It's intensifying flavor. This is the beautiful thing about live fire cooking as well, is you really have to spend more time managing it. You can see there's no flame shooting up around it, right? So when you start your fire, you wanna get a good fire going on and you wanna bring it down to coals and you don't wanna have flames coming up over the top of it. Things are gonna cook way too quickly and it's really hard to like really get in there and do your work when your hair is on fire. It's quite uncomfortable, I wouldn't recommend it. So our pan is dry. Do you hear how it sounds different? Like you could hear the liquid before and you can hear the liquid moving and now you can hear it making contact with that cast iron just with what you're hearing. You can tell something is changing. We're gonna add our arborio rice here. This is where the cook gets to choose, okay? If you wanna toast the rice, You'll get some nice color on it, and you're gonna get a little bit more of a, a nutty flavor to it. I'm gonna leave it like this and not bring that, that nutty flavor to it. I'll keep it a little bit lighter with the tomato sauce, and I'm gonna be using chicken stock, and the chicken stock is gonna give it a little bit more richness. I'm waiting for the rice to kind of warm up a little bit. And then once it's kind of warmed up a little bit, I'll start to slowly add the chicken stock. When I add the chicken stock, I'm only gonna bring it to the level of the rice. Let that water reduce down till the pan is dry or the chicken stock, then I'll add more chicken stock, let it reduce down, and I'll keep going over that process. And by doing that nice and slowly, you're gonna get a nice even cook on your rice and you're gonna be pulling the starch out of that aborio rice. You wanna pull that starch out so it gets nice and creamy. Add our chicken stock to where it's level. The other beautiful thing about risotto, it's pretty forgiving. So if you overcook it a little bit, it's totally fine. If you undercook it a little bit, if you just let it set aside, it'll do the carryover cooking and it'll be fine. You hear that? You don't hear anything, right? More fire, we want more heat. So let's get some more heat on. Cause right now I'd want it to be bubbling a little bit. So we're just gonna move this off to the side. Whoop, move that right there. Use some small pieces here. We're gonna let it settle down just a little bit. We'll see if I can put this on there and just put it off to the side. It's already starting to come up, so it's good. Like these cast iron skillets, they really hold on to the heat, which is really nice. You hear that? It's boiling again, so that's good. I have it pulled off to the side a little bit so I can control just a little bit because the fire is hotter than what I want. 
but I wanna to continue to work with it. You can see right here, it's going pretty hard. And then over here, it's nice and quiet. It's cooler on this side. So if I stir it, it stays nice and even. I mean, that's the beauty of live fire cooking. So you don't have as much control over it. So you kind of have to use your knowledge and it's, it's a little bit more visceral. It really engages you as a chef. You see how the bubbles are getting thicker? That means the starch is coming out and that's the creamy goodness that we're looking for. We'll keep on with the process and you're gonna spend probably about 30 minutes just kind of stirring until this is ready to go. Once I, I get to the point where the rice is almost al dente, al dente is like almost cooked through, that's when I'm gonna add in my shellfish. Introducing something cold like that into something that's hot, it's gonna like bring that temperature way down and it's gonna take a minute to bring that temperature back up. Then the clams and the mussels have a chance to kind of slowly open up and it's not seen, you know, such terribly hot heat that it ends up making like little chewy balls of shellfish. We've all done it, right? We've all overcooked our, overcooked our shrimp. It's great to play racquetball with, but not so good to eat. I tell you, there's nothing more beautiful than hanging your head over a pot and watching it cook and listening to it and watching the bubbles. It's really, really meditative. And being in the forest, like cooking outside, it's pretty special. As it starts to thicken, you don't wait until the pan is dry anymore to add your liquid, because if you do that, it'll start to burn because so much of the starch is starting to come out. Do you hear the sound of the bubbles? Do you hear how that changed? When we first started doing it, it was a lot faster. It had a faster cadence because they were lighter and they weren't full of that starch. And now you hear it, it's like more of a bass tone. And then that's because the bubbles are thicker. Not that you have to know that to cook this recipe. It's just, it's kind of a little gift for you to, to hear. I'm watching the grain change in color. And as it's changing in color, I know it's getting close to being done. That's because I've been doing it for 30 years. So you're not going to look at rice and know when it's done, you know, all the time. So it's always good to have like that little grain. And I was right this time. So we'll add the tomatoes to it. You can see how it brought the liquid up. Now listen to it. It's quiet, right? I want it to be like ripping hot. Like I want to hear that noise. And once I hear that noise, it's hot enough that I can put my shellfish in because when I put it in, it's going to cool down and then it'll slowly come back up. You see how you can see bubbles all over? We're gonna add in, add our shrimp, give it a little stir so they can marry along with the, the rice. And you can see they're like starting to kind of slowly open up. You see that guy, how it's starting to open up? See how the shrimp, it went from translucent and it's starting to get a little bit of pink on it. That means it's starting to cook. We have some peas in there. We're gonna add our spinach. I'm constantly seeing I'm tucking and I'm looking at the bottom. Are we sticking? And it looks like it could actually use a little bit more water. A little piece of spinach here. I was smelling like a burnt herb. I thought someone was smoking weed. So now I'm gonna add some cheese. A lot of cheese, a lot of cheese. I'm waiting to the end to put salt and pepper in here. It's actually quite salty because it's, it's carrying that that brackish water in there, right? A lot of the seasoning is just gonna come naturally from the shellfish. I'd like a little bit more salt. That's good. Look how quickly, you don't need to do too much. See how it's like kind of watery? It's creamy, but it's kind of watery. We wanna make it even creamier. We want this to be really, really decadent. And people freak out when they see this much butter. Butter is not bad for you. It's okay, people, it's okay. Just calm down. I mean, if you have it all the time, fair enough. But if this is like, your luxurious thing that you're gonna have, you know, for the day, then you're all good. I wanna mix that in before that butter breaks because we don't want it to be greasy. We want it to be creamy. You see how it went from kind of watery and how it's getting to this nice creamy consistency? Pepper. Oh my God, it's the smallest pepper grinder in the world. <laughs> all right, okay, a little bit more salt. And then I taste, taste, taste. I wanna always make sure I'm like, I'm checking the seasoning. A Little more butter. Just a skosh. That shellfish is looking good. We're now at that point where we're gonna finish it with a little bit of lemon juice. If you have acid, it lengthens the finish on your palate. And that's a lot of times the difference between having something that's kind of like, yeah, that was pretty good to like, oh wow, that is really good. Where you still get to like, you savor those flavors. I'm gonna take it off the fire. I'm gonna put it in here in the lid and then we'll be ready to eat. 
All right, here is our one pot risotto ready to go. So we have these beautiful flowers that we were talking about earlier. Garnish over the top. Let's get a little bit closer. Hi friends, we did it. One pot seafood risotto, local shellfish. Please like and subscribe. And if you have any comments or if you wanna see more stuff like this, please let us know. Take care, we'll see you next time. Let's get a little bit closer. Out of the kitchen. This would be a good workout for me. I'm going to be like ninja flipping over the table. Wow! <laughs>